You are listening to episode number 72 of the Everything Ham Radio podcast. In today's episode, we talk with Glenn Papil, uh, KW5GP, about the Arduino project books that he has written, and uh, maybe touch on a couple other things, so stay tuned. Hey everybody, you are listening to the Everything Ham Radio Podcast. Like I said, this is episode number 72, and today we are talking with Glenn Papil, a Kilo Whiskey 5 Golf Papa, and we are talking to him about Arduino projects. He is the author of the Arduino for Ham Radio, More Arduino for Ham Radio, his new book, and High Speed Multimedia for uh, Amateur Radio, uh, which a book that I have and thoroughly have enjoyed. And by the end of this uh, interview, uh, I'm pretty much going to buy his his at least his new book on on Arduino projects. So there is a lot of great information in these books, and we're talking a lot about them. So I hope that you enjoy this. Uh, this episode as much as I did talking with Glenn. Um, if you want to find some additional information as well as all the links that we're talking about in this episode, um, you can find it on the show notes of today's episode at everythinghamradio.com forward slash podcast forward slash 72. That's the number seven two. Uh, you can follow me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash everything ham radio. I also have the page at facebook.com forward slash everything ham radio. I am on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash everything ham radio and on Twitter at K five C L M. So I guess without further ado, let's go ahead and get with our interview, or get on with our interview with Glenn. Uh, So here we go. Hey everybody, we are here with Glenn Papil, uh, Kilo Whiskey 5 Golf Papa. He is the author of the Arduino for Ham Radio, um, High Speed Multimedia for for Amateur Radio, and his latest book, More Arduino for Ham Radio. So uh, it's great having you on here, Glenn. First off, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in this hobby? Okay. Um, way back when, uh, dirt was real new back then. Uh, <laughs> in, in high school, um, there was actually uh, two of my friends uh, were hams, and uh, they had it was a brand new high school. We had an electronics class, and it was just outstanding. And I uh, got introduced uh, to the hobby through them. And so, uh, you know, here I was, you know, 15, 16, and I had to get my license. And I had an old Heathkit HW16, and I worked CW as a novice, you know, upgraded as quick as I could to general. And that was back when you had to do the code and stuff. And uh, then I got the advanced shortly thereafter because I wanted to play with slow scan. And, uh, you know, then, you know, years went by. <laughs> And uh, in the meantime, um, it was obvious as soon as I started with the electronics that that was where I needed to be. So I've had a career in electronics literally since the time I was 15, 16. Uh, started out as a DJ, announcer, technician at a Spanish radio station in Miami. And before you ask, no, I don't speak fluent Spanish anymore, but I was pretty <laughs> good back then. Um And uh, then I went to work for uh, Ray Calmilgo, building modems, and just kind of progressed on up from there. Uh, uh, When I was 19, I got picked up by uh, Control Data Corporation, and I spent uh, seven years uh, doing military turbojet research data acquisition with them and Pratt Whitney Aircraft. Oh, wow. And and that's, yeah. I mean, I hit it young and and hit it running and never really slowed down. And... uh, in the mid '80s, I dropped out of the hobby a little bit. I still had my license, but wasn't real active, and got into showing cats for a few years. And uh, then jobs changed and had to move, and pretty much got out of everything. And then about five years ago, a coworker said he wanted to get his tech license, and that got me back into it. And I've been at it, you know, with both feet ever since. You know, that's. That's one of the things about any kind of hobby, especially amateur radio. You know, you you drop out of it when you get kind of bored with it, or you think you've done everything, and you drop out and you come back, and and everything has changed so much, and there's so much more to learn that you just kind of 
you, you get excited about it so easy and you can just, you know, kind of take off where you were and just go so much farther. Oh, absolutely. And my advice to anybody who's even thinking about dropping out, don't. Just go find something else to do because you wish you hadn't. Mm -hmm. That's that's really the way I am is I wished I hadn't dropped out all those years. Um, you know, I could have been writing these books and having so much fun 20 years ago. No. And uh, just didn't really realize it until recently. And, yeah, it's changed so much. I mean, you know, back then all we had was CW sideband, you know, radio teletype and, you know, slow scan. The satellites were brand new back then. And, you know, now we've got all sorts of digital and the PSK and the JT65. It just it's changed so much that there's very little you know, if you do get bored with one aspect, it's real easy to, to shift over into another one and have a whole new world to play in. Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, there's there's so many avenues that you can go to. I mean, I've, did, I've been doing this. This will be episode number 72, and I've done this weekly. And it's like, you know, I never run out of things to talk about, and I never run out of things to, to learn about. I mean, I learn something new every Every episode, whether I'm I'm talking with somebody like you or whether I'm you know doing research and, and doing it just by myself, there's so much I learn and just like, you know, I, I want to do this. I want to do that. <laughs> yeah, there's not enough time. Well, time is not so much the <laughs> issue so much. It's more along the lines of the money that, that Mama didn't want to let, let loose of. <laughs> but see, now we got to get you into the Arduino because it's not going to take a whole lot of money to get you into it. Well, there you go. So... I'm I'm getting there. I'm, I I I listen, I listen to uh, to uh, the uh, Ham Radio 360 Workbench podcast, and they're real big on Arduinos and and Raspberry Pis and and all the the small board computer stuff. Um, you know, it's pretty much every every project that they make and they talk about has some some kind of Arduino or or Raspberry Pi on it, and it's like it's. I think really the hardest part for me is getting used to the linux side of the thing you know i'm, I'm a windows person unfortunately and it's there you know way back when when dos was big i was you know i knew how to go around that no problem but the linux for some strange reason i just can't wrap my head around <laughs> don't feel alone uh, i have to do a little bit of everything in my day job i'm a network engineer and a technology consultant and i have to do windows mac linux you name it and yeah, I'm, <clears throat> Linux is no. I don't want to say it's not my favorite, but yeah, it's a little more difficult to learn and, and get around in. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, the thing I like is with the Arduino. You know, the Raspberry Pi to me is really just a baby Linux computer. So if you're mm -hmm. you can work a, a PC in Linux, you're you know you'll be right at home with the Pi. Uh, the Arduino, you know, it uses a very low level C plus plus derivative that was really written for people who aren't programmers. So it's much easier to learn. It was actually designed in uh, Italy at an art institute for artists and, you know, people in that area to work with, not electronics people. Hmm. So it was, you know, if they can do it, we can do it. Yeah, you would think so anyways. Yeah. <laughs> But it's actually, well, let's put it this way. Uh, a couple of years ago, we did a three-weekend seminar at the local library, and we had these kids build a robotic car kit and uh, out of Arduino, and we taught five-year-olds how to solder. And from age five to 13, these kids wrote their own program just on three weekends worth of training. Wow. So, again, I say if they can do it, we can do it. If we can't do it, then, then <laughs> there's something wrong with us. <laughs> yeah, but no, that's that's the that's really part of the appeal of the Arduino is that it is so easy to work with, and odds are somebody has already been there before you, so you can you know use their code and as a base and build from what they've already done to take some of the hard work away from you. Mm -hmm. I know there's there's you know a lot of programs that are a lot of projects that i've seen dealing with arduino that deal with with you know ham radio with uh other stuff that that kind of um are like a side shoot off type thing of of ham radio that you could use you know weather stations and and keyers and there's so much out there that can be done that it's you know 
it, it's kind of like, you know, why not? Why not do it? Because they're not that much money, right? They're like, what, five bucks or something like that? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the Arduino board itself is only $3, and, you know, you're not talking a lot of wiring and, and whatnot. For example, uh, in my first book, I have a lightning detector project that will detect lightning up to 40 kilometers away. So that's 23, 20-something 20, 20 20 miles. Wow. And it takes a grand total of eight wires and about $30 in parts. Huh. Now, that so, would be interesting. Yeah. And that's really um, – the, the thing about the Arduino is it doesn't take a lot of wiring and a lot of soldering to give you a basic working project, and you can take it as far as you want it. Uh, you've got multiple variations. If you need more I.O. pins or whatever, you can use a variation on the Arduino because this is all open source stuff, so people are building and adding to it every day. Hmm. Interesting. So, for example, uh, and I know we're jumping ahead here, but in my new book, we actually build a JT65 transceiver that costs a whopping $60 to build. Wow. So, um, you know, even the most complex projects don't have to be expensive. Hmm. That's, 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 uh, I'm, 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 I'm left without words here. I mean, it, that's just so, <laughs> just blows my mind that that so much stuff can be done with so little money now you know wow i i, yeah. I, do, I, I look forward to the next segment guys and, and if you are listening make sure that you stick around for for uh the next two segments because we're going to talk about uh, some of the projects that he has in his books and 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 his new book and some of the stuff that's in it um but before we do that um is there a lot of crossover between the use of the Arduino in uh, ham mesh networking? No, not really. They're pretty much separate. Uh, there are a few things you can do, but I think you would really, uh, at that point, you'd want a Raspberry Pi for the Linux and the Ethernet and the, the horsepower capability. So does the Arduino not have the, the Ethernet and stuff in there? It, it does, but uh, the, the Arduino is more of a controller. Uh, so it want, you, you want to control and sense things with it. And with the mesh network, you know, I guess you could put it on there as a remote weather station and things of that nature. So, yes, you can. Um, but uh, generally, you're going to want to do applications like messaging and email and chat and file transfers with the mesh stuff. Okay. So the, I guess the, the Arduino maybe is, is more along the lines of maybe the industrial side of things? Right. Over, the con- over Raspberry Pi? Yeah, the controlling side of things like antenna rotator controllers and things of that nature. Hmm, okay. Uh, well, that's good to know. Yeah, whereas the Pi, you know, you're going to have to write all sorts of Linux and C code to control a rotator with the Arduino. It's literally, you know, a few wires, a transistor, you know, a couple transistors and relay, and bang, you've interfaced it to your rotator controller. Hmm. So do, do we see foresee a... Uh, Raspberry Pi for ham radio book in the near future? <laughs> I don't know. That is, that's an option. Uh, right now, I'm kind of on a break in between books. Uh, ask me that again in the fall after I've had a chance to recover from this last one. <laughs> well, and I know I would really look forward to that. I'm, I really want to buy your, your Arduino books, and I'm definitely going to have to break down and do that because – uh, just some of the stuff that I've seen in some of the other interviews that you've done uh, with uh, one, especially with uh, Tom um, over at um, uh, my mind just went blank. W5KUB. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> over, over on his channel in the uh, Amateur Radio Roundtable, uh, some of the interviews that you've done there, some of the projects that, that you've showed. So uh, if you want to see in any of his projects that, he, that we talk about today, I'm sure he's talked about them before on, on uh, Tom's program. Uh, definitely check that out. It's it, like I said, it's w5kub.com, um, and they have a weekly live show on Tuesday nights. So uh, check that out, and I'm sure he will be on there again. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> so, but if you want to see a visual aspect of that rather than just listening to the audio, make sure you check out uh, the Amateur Radio Roundtable and his interviews with with him. Um, so. And my mind just went blank. I hate it when that happens. All right. Well, let, let me <laughs> let me tell you a little story that happened at Hamvention when you're talking about you need to buy my books. All right. Uh, gentleman came up to the area when I was signing the new book, 
and he had this kind of confused look on his face and he you know he's, I said oh you're looking for a book and he's like well yeah and I said well you need to buy mine and of course I was just joking and he's like no 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 I'm here for another book oh, okay <laughs> and then we got to talking and he ended up walking away with both of my books saying his kids don't know this but they're going to be learning the Arduino <laughs> 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 and that's the same thing. It's just the appeal. One, he had never really heard about it. And once he sat down and started talking with me, he's like, this is cool. I can build all sorts of stuff with this. Hmm. And they don't they don't really think about that. You know, it, it's so new and, and radically different from mainstream ham radio. Mm-hmm. Well, but, definitely for sure. That I mean, I, I am I am ex- I am excited for the, for the next segment because I really want to know about some of these these. Uh, things that you have in your books um, and any uh, if y'all are looking for buying some of his books I will have links to each of them uh, on in the show notes of today's episode you can find that at everything hamradio.com forward slash podcast forward slash 72 so make sure you check that out buy some of his books help him help spread the word about the Arduino <laughs> for <Yeah. Amateur> radio <laughs> And, and really, what what this is is I caught it at the right time. There's a big resurgence in the the home brewing and the maker world of building mm-hmm. things again, and that's died for a number of years, and that's really come back. And it's things like the Arduino and the Raspberry Pi that's leading that that whole way. Well, yeah, because it makes it so easy. You know, this this the Arduino and the Pi they're you know they're such small computers basically that. Right. You know, you can do so much with it that, you know, before, you know, 10 years ago would take, you know, figuring out circuit diagrams and capacitors and resistors and diodes and all that good stuff to do the same thing that right. you would do with, you know, one pin out and a wire or something like that coming from Arduino. So, you know, it is just exploding. I, I have seen so many things, so many DIY projects with am, dealing with amateur radio that deal with Arduino and the, and the Pi. So... Yeah, I'm I'm exp- I'm excited, and I need to find a place that I can spread out a little bit here in my in my shack somewhere. I don't know exactly where, but um, that I can do something like this stuff because I'm 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 really looking forward to this next segment. So um, I think we'll go ahead and take a quick break and hear from our sponsors, uh, West Mountain Radio, and we'll be back with Glenn, and we're going to talk about his uh, first Arduino book and maybe touch a little bit on the uh, the mesh networking book that he did too. So stick around; we'll be right back. Are you tired of lousy propagation conditions and wondering how to work some real DX for a change? Maybe you spin the dial and wonder what's going on below the voice segment of the HF bands. The answer is, you're missing out. You're missing out on digital modes, a rapidly growing and exciting part of amateur radio. Work real DX with the incredible JT65 and JT9 modes. It's no exaggeration when I tell you, you will work stations you never thought possible, even using low power and compromised antennas. Have fun making new contacts in modes such as PSK31, Olivia, Radio Teletype, Slow Scan TV, and many more. The Rig Blaster Advantage is everything you need to operate these exciting digital modes. Made right here in the U.S., the Rig Blaster interface has set the standards for nearly 20 years. Thousands of satisfied operators have learned their Rig Blaster Advantage will provide solid digital communications, easy operating, and reliability. Don't miss out on the fun and excitement any longer. Head on over to everythinghamradio.com forward slash WMR for more information and learn how to get your free USB port monitor with your purchase. All right, we are back with Glenn Papil, uh, Kilo Whiskey 5 Golf Bumpa. We are going to talk about his books in this segment. So the first thing, tell me about how, how let, let's talk about your writing process about your first book. Your, uh, I'm assuming the Arduino was for him reader. That was your first book, right? That's correct. So tell me about how you went about writing this. How, did, what was your whole process for it? You mean besides panicking? Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've done some writing. I've written several magazine articles through the years, but never anything over a couple pages. And uh, I was in Huntsville uh, at the Ham Fest there, and I was actually doing my first Arduino forum. And uh, 
I don't know. The subject just came up. Uh, the you know the uh, Ham AWRL's book. Uh, what was that? The uh, Arduino and Pickaxe book uh, was very popular, and AWRL was looking for somebody to write a sequel to that. And I guess I made the mistake and said, I can do a book like that. <laughs> and apparently. Somebody at AWRL heard me because the next thing I know, they contacted me and asked me if I was serious. And uh, so basically, that, open foot, insert mouth. Open foot, insert mouth, and you know, uh, or, ama- yeah. amazingly enough, <clears throat> yeah, it was pretty much <laughs> like, what have I just done to myself? But at the same time, I knew I could do it, and I felt that at that time, I was probably one of the few ham radio people that really was into the Arduino. So, uh, you know, I gave it a shot, and the the mission that I was given uh, from Steve Ford at AWRL was uh, we want new and unique projects. Try not to do things that have already been done. So that was pretty much the mission. And uh, what came out of it is the first book, and a lot of it came over our Ham Radio Club breakfast discussions we used to have a breakfast every saturday morning and we'd talk about things and uh one of my friends there uh tim billingsley he's the one that got me into the arduino and so we were able to talk arduino and some of the other club members were interested and we just kind of came up with a list of you know kind of cool projects that we'd like to see the arduino do and that's where i came back and built the projects and, of course, as part of the building process, you have to document it. So had to do the schematics and everything else. And then, believe it or not, uh, because of that organization, and that was uh, uh, Craig Barron's NM4T, who is, uh, ran the QRP Archie, or the QRP forums at the Huntsville Ham Fest, and uh, that's how I met him, was a great coach on how to write and how to organize and how to outline. And pretty much it's once we got the organization and the process down, the book basically wrote itself. I know that's, you know, you know, kind of self-serving to say, but this one, it really did. It just, it just came out. So, so what kind of projects did y'all come up with? Well, um, the, the, the coolest one that I think is the lightning detector. Um, they're all cool in my opinion. And I'll tell you a few of the others. Um, we were having breakfast at the, you know, at the breakfast on Saturday, and I said, wouldn't it be cool if, and by the way, those are the words, if you ever hear me say those, you need to run, because that means something really <laughs> bad is about to happen. I said, wouldn't it be cool if you could build a lightning detector that would disconnect your antennas whenever it detected lightning, and then 30 minutes after the lightning went away, it would reconnect them for you so you could be out of town and know your equipment's safe. Now, that is a cool idea. Well, and the, the response came back was, yeah, that's a cool idea, but lightning detectors are expensive. Okay, challenge. <laughs> I I came home and I started googling, and next thing I know, I found a lightning detector module for the Arduino that cost twenty bucks. Hmm. And I'm like, okay. Next thing you know, eight wires later, and a little bit of code, I've got a working lightning detector. And we actually used that at field day about. Three years ago, we had horrendous thunderstorms for all field day. And we just used my lightning detector, and any time it went off, we stayed away from the rigs until 20 minutes after the lightning, with the last lightning strike. So we were able to work some, but uh, it was going off all night. So uh, that was really a a fun and practical project that came out of that wouldn't it be cool if moment. Uh, So did did you actually get it figured out where it would disconnect your antennas or just like send a signal saying hey there's lightning right now i have it just to do the signal um one of the reasons for that one i didn't have any coax relays at the time which i solved by going to dayton shortly thereafter and for anybody that went to dayton that year i apologize there were no coax relays to be found they were all in my backpack (laughs) i think i bought every one that was on a table there (laughs) Uh, but uh yeah uh but also the way I build things with the Arduino, because it's so fun, uh, I didn't want to do this as, hey, everybody, look at what I can do. Now copy it. It's I give you a working practical concept, a working device, a functional device, and then I stop and say, 
okay, now you throw the kitchen sink in the way you would do it. And so you've got a challenge, but I've given you a head start. And so I've, I, that, that formula has really worked, uh, and a lot of people have, have enjoyed that because I don't do a, a shiny gold-plated object and they, there's nothing more they can do. It's just build it and put it on a shelf. Um, they like the fact that I leave a challenge for them to, to expand on. So does your lightning detector like tell you which direction it's coming from and all that too? or No. All it does is tell you the strength and the distance, and actually it uses a really neat algorithm. This is just a tiny, you know, tick-sized chip, uh, but it's got all sorts of uh, algorithms inside, so it, it will not it false detect, uh, or, you know, I, I won't say will not, but it, it very rarely will false detect on, on a, you know, spark gap, you know, spark running by or whatever. It will truly detect the lightning. And it will detect the leading edge of the storm front is the way the algorithm is calculated. Hmm. So it basically will tell you the distance to the storm front and the intensity uh, of that strike. Hmm. So no more seeing the lightning flash and, and then waiting for the thunder and counting seconds in between. You can actually no. know exactly how far away it is. That, that's pretty right. neat. And, you know, 20 kilometers or 40 kilometers away, 23 miles, I think is what that is. You know, that's over the horizon. You're not going to see it or hear it at that distance. So you've got a lot of early warning. Hmm. That's cool. Yeah. And so that was that was one. But one of the surprises, I have a random code, uh, Morse code generator. And all it does is randomly generate Morse code. Um, but it does it at a variable rate of 5 to 35 words a minute. So you can gradually increase the speed and surprisingly enough that's been one of the most popular projects in the book everybody's enjoyed building that one so and that's you know very easy to build but we've also done things like uh uh you know a uh, talking swr meter i found a text-to-speech module and a swr design and so now it will tell you what the swr is and the amazing part about that is the president of the Kentucky Council for the Blind contacted me, uh, thinking such a wonderful project and wanted more of the speech projects. And uh, so that was a, an area I'd never even thought of when I was designing that. I was thinking, wouldn't it be cool if I had an SWR meter that spoke at me? And uh, we couldn't program in the verbiage that uh, Tim's wife wanted to put in it. Uh, Loosely translated is, honey, your stuff's broke again. <laughs> and uh, we, we said, no, 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 let's just, you know, have it give you stuff. But you could you could put SWR warning levels in it and things like that. Um, hmm. And since he's uh, somewhat visually impaired, that's a great help. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then one of the other things we did is a, a Morse code keyboard where you can actually type on a PC keyboard and it would send the Morse code for you, plus it had a few memories in it. So you basically had a little Morse code keyboard for a couple bucks. That does it decode it, too? No, but there's a project in the book that does the decoding. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, now, Okay, here's, so here's the question, then. Um, do you have to have separate Arduinos to do that, or can you do both the keyboard and the decoding on the same Arduino? I would say probably could do them on one. I've only done them separately. Uh, you might have to go to what I call uh, an Arduino variant that would have more memory and maybe a little more I.O. Uh, they don't cost a whole lot more. And uh, that would give you enough I.O. pins and memory to, to actually combine them. But, yeah, I don't see any reason why they couldn't be combined. Of course, then again, with only $3, I mean, it's not like it's going to be you know breaking the bank for, for, for uh, having two Arduinos. Right. You know, but uh, no, that's actually one of my thoughts, and I think I left that as an idea for somebody else to do. Um, you know, but yeah, that's something I would like to do at some point. And uh, some of the other projects we did is uh, uh, rotator controllers. You know, if you've got one of the older CDE high gain ham M style rotors, uh, you don't have computer control capability on those. You do with the newer ones if you've got a wallet full of money. <laughs> and uh, I don't. So uh, I actually took an old, uh, I think mine's a Ham 2, and added an Arduino in it and a couple relays. 
and now it's completely computer controlled from Ham Radio Deluxe and the other software. Wow. So, you know, it, and it's a very simple modification. Hmm. It, so. it, it, it blows my mind some of the things that we can do with these little bitty teeny weeny little $3 computer boards. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Well, the thing is, it's not so much the boards, it's the modules that they have available for them. Uh, you can buy almost any kind of LCD or LED type display, uh, all sorts of sensors, you know, uh, carbon dioxide, methane, all sorts of uh, gas and, and liquid sensors. And then, of course, you've got the lightning detector. Uh, in my new book, which we'll talk about in a bit, I've got a $5 module that you can use to send voice. So now you can have almost anything you own talk to you for five bucks. Um, you know, you've got Ethernet modules for five bucks. You know, it's it's really the modules and the fact that the Arduino is designed to interact with all of these modules that make it such a really cool tool. Hmm. That's pretty neat. I'm definitely going to have to buy the book here. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> I didn't yeah. try to sell it to you. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> I didn't make you buy it, but I've... When you talk to me, it's like, he's going to buy all three before it's over. <laughs> <laughs> I already have the first one. I already oh, have well, the Mesh Network, so I'm, I'm right. one up. You're one up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. you still got two more to go. We'll have to work on you. <laughs> but uh, that was part of the fun, though, is those projects in the first book, the, the design criteria was to keep the price as low as possible, keep them as unique and different as possible, but still make them practical ham radio projects mm -hmm. so that, uh, you know, People wouldn't just build them, put them on the shelf, and say, "We, I built an Arduino project." Uh, they, they'd build them, and in fact, uh, one gentleman actually built um, one of my projects from the first book, or is it the second? No, my first book. I believe it was the uh, CW decoder. I'd have to check, uh, and he actually entered it in a homebrew contest and won first place with it hmm. because of the modifications he'd put on it. Wow. So. It, it's it's nice to see people taking this stuff and going to the next level with it. Mm -hmm. you know, that that was the goal I had, and I wanted to keep it cheap because you know I don't, I don't like to spend a lot of money. I'm I'm the cheapest guy there is, and you know three dollar Adreno and a handful of parts, you know that's right up my alley. Right. And it also, if you're new to it, it takes the fear away, because if you blow something, what's the worst you've done? Blow a three dollar board. Mm -hmm. You know that's. It's nothing. It's not like the old days where if you fried a motherboard, you know, you were at a couple hundred dollars and you were dead until you got a new one. Here it's three dollars and okay, reach up in the parts bin, I got another one waiting for it. Of course when you do that you see all the other ones up there shaking because they just saw what happened to their brother. So <laughs> it's like pick him, pick him. But <laughs> but uh, surprisingly enough Throughout all of the building and all of the experimentation, and I, you know, I've been called a, a serial offender of Ohm's law. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, I'm the kind of person that goes, okay, you're made to do this, but what if? And I don't necessarily exceed the design specifications, but I do things in ways that they weren't meant to be used. And yes, I will smoke things. But I will tell you, in four or five years of Arduino building, I have blown maybe two or three boards total, and maybe one or two modules total. Very, very little smoke. So it's very forgiving. Well, that's good. Especially with you know somebody like me that doesn't have any idea what they're doing. I'm sure I'm I'm sure I'm probably going to smoke one or two. <laughs> well, I have a friend here um, that wanted to build a, a homebrew contest entry for the. Uh, QRP Archie contest in Dayton, and she had built a lot of kits. So she was proficient at soldering and building kits and following instructions, but she had never scratch built anything from a schematic. And she taught herself how to read schematics, and she took one of the designs from my first book and added her own ideas. I helped her a little bit with concept and, you know, what would need to be done, but she actually did the majority of the design, and she did all of the construction. She had never done point-to-point -point wiring or worked with perf boards or anything, and she built it, and it worked first time. Hmm. You know, so it's not that hard. It really isn't. 
Well, there's a lot of interesting um, projects that you've talked about. What what else is in your your first book? Uh, let's see. I've got a CW beacon and a fox hunt gear, uh, so that if you want to. Um, uh, uh, Tim has a 10 meter beacon up and his controller is a little flaky so I'm like well let's get an Arduino and replace that beacon and that's where that project came from and then it was like well you know with the twist we can make this a fox hunt keyer so that it would key it uh, like an HT and then send you a little you know message every so often so you can hide this thing see now they will not let me play in fox hunts <laughs> okay, because my idea of a fox hunt gear is to put that thing on a little robot and have it run around a field, <laughs> and every time it keys, it runs 50 meters in a random direction. <laughs> they will not let me play fox hunts, but that was the idea behind the fox hunt gear. Uh, another one was a fan speed controller. Um, you know, basically, you don't need fans running at full speed all the time, mm-hmm. so why not have it? Uh, vary its speed based on the temperature. So it uses a little uh, temperature sensor chip and uh, uses pulse width modulation to control the fan speed. So it automatically adjusts its cooling speed. Hmm. Uh, then uh, a digital compass. Uh, there was a digital compass module, so why not build your own you know, electronic compass? Uh, then I do a little weather station with uh, barometric pressure, humidity, and uh, temperature all in a, a little module. Does it do wind speed to you? Uh, no, but it can. There's no reason you couldn't sense wind speed. Just uh, do a little uh, paper cup thing for your anemometer and have that to a little DC motor and read that on one of the analog pins of the Arduino, and you could easily calculate wind speed. Hmm. So, okay, let's let's talk, let's talk about this weather station here just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> that that let, piqued my interest in. Let's not because we, we there's a we we revisit this a little bit cooler in the second book. Well, okay, <laughs> but I'm going to hold you to that. We are going to uh, talk oh, about absolutely. it eventually. <laughs> oh, oh, I will absolutely. <laughs> uh, but the other thing we've got we've got a little RF probe that does an LED bar graph, so you can uh, look at signal strength uh, for RF floating around your shack. Uh, okay. A solar uh, battery charge monitor. It will actually monitor the current and voltage coming in from a solar cell. So you can, you know, even power an Arduino from a solar cell, but you have a little monitor on it. Yeah, will, uh, it, will it cut off the the power coming from the solar cell if it uh, if the battery is full? Uh, that's not my design, but yeah, it could easily be done. Hmm. And you could easily scale this up to power a, a monster, you know, hundred or two hundred watt solar array just by you know switching in relays and, and higher charging current and stuff. Hmm. So it's. Uh, the, the current probe stuff, and again, we revisit that in the second book. Uh, they have current modules that let you sense up to 30 amps uh, that aren't much bigger than a postage stamp. And you can also go higher than that. Uh, and in the, the second book, we take it up to 250 amps. Wow. So you can go that high. We've got an on-air indicator that will turn on a little sign, you know, let people know you're on the air based on RF and a delay that whenever it senses RF, it'll kick the sign on, and after X amount of time, it'll turn it off. Hmm. Um, then we got the talking SWR meter. I've got a talking GPS uh, time and grid square indicator. And this is the thing about GPS modules. I started playing with that. I did not realize that GPS modules gave you extremely accurate time in addition to positioning information. And it actually qualifies as what they call a stratum one clock, which is the highest accuracy clock that you can get. So the, the time signals coming off of GPSs are extremely accurate. So why not build a little handheld module that tells you what the UTC time is? And it's also a GPS, so it can tell you your latitude and longitude. And, oh, by the way, let's calculate your grid square because you're in a contest and you're a rover and you don't know what grid square you're in. So that was the idea behind that one. And then we did fall back and do a, a more generic. We did an iambic keyer that will do uh, both iambic uh, A and B modes, and it's adjustable from 5 to 35 words a minute. Uh, we do a waveform generator to let you generate uh, sine, square, and uh, triangle waves. And then we've got the, the Morse code keyboard we talked about. Then one of my exp- my first uh, experimentation in satellite tracking, I built a servo-controlled 
satellite tracker. And it actually is a little model that's got what looks like a, a satellite beam on it. And it uses an azimuth and elevation assembly and a, uh, a model sailboat, uh, sail winch servo to do the, the 360 degree rotation. And it will actually track and point to the satellites using uh, SatPC32. Hmm. And what's cool about this is we've done several uh, of the uh, Kids' Day events, and we brought out our big satellite stuff. And so here we've got the, uh, and we'll talk about that in a second, here we've got the monster real antenna array tracking the satellite, and then we've got my little model on the ground tracking the big one, and they're both pointing in the same direction. Uh, so that was my first one. And then I went further and actually turned that into modifying the older uh, Yesu satellite uh, G5400, 5500s that don't have the computer interface. Uh, there's a project in this book to adapt that for interface into SatPC32 and Ham Radio Deluxe. So you can add automatic satellite tracking to your older controller. Then we've got the CW decoder and then the lightning detector, and then we talked about the uh, the high gain rotor controller. We build, we modify a working one, and then we actually built one from scratch. So we had, a friend of mine got a rotor but no controller, so I actually built a rotor controller from scratch for him for his Ham Three, and then it interfaces to Ham Radio Deluxe, so he's got full control on it. Hmm. Wow! So that's that's the first book. And you get all of this stuff for a measly small price of twenty nine ninety five. Yeah, yeah, that that's <laughs> a lot of information in the in, well. I would say a little bitty book, but you know, a relatively small price tag. I mean, that's that's awesome. And I'm definitely going to buy it. I'm actually like on Amazon right now, so I'm just like out of the part. So that's just wrong. <laughs> I have to, I have to give this disclaimer. I did not put him up to this, folks. I did not make him do this. Uh, but uh, the other thing about the book, uh, before we move on, is uh, the first seven or eight chapters. Uh, let me look at that real quick. First, uh, let's see, it's going to be the first six chapters. I spent an introduction to the Arduino, uh, the various modules, the various boards, the, the features, the specifications, how to use it. Now, you know, I do expect you know, the reader to be able to do some basic soldering and follow schematics and stuff. And, you know, you need to be familiar with the Arduino enough to at least, you know, load the programs that are called, we call them sketches. But that's really it. Um, you know, you don't need to learn a whole lot, but the first six chapters of the book are spent on what I call the foundation material to get you ready to build the project. So I don't leave you hanging. All righty, so... so. I guess with that, let's go ahead and take another break, and we're going to hear from uh, KB6 and you on his books on the uh, um, No Nonsense Study Guide. So uh, check that out, and we will be right back with Glenn, and we're going to talk about his new book, The More Arduino Projects for Ham Radio. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hi. This is Dan, KB6NU, author of the No Nonsense Amateur Radio License Study Guides. My study guides have helped thousands get their license or upgrade to general class or extra class, and they can help you too. What makes them unique is my No Nonsense style. I don't bamboozle you with a lot of text. Instead, I give you just what you need to know in a simple, straightforward way that's designed to help you pass the test. One reader even told me, your study guide explained in a couple of paragraphs topics that the license manual needed a couple of pages to cover. Another wrote, the clarity and simplicity of your descriptions blew the license manual away. My study guides are available in paperback, in a variety of ebook formats, and even as audiobooks. Get your copy today. Go to kb6nu.com slash ethr for more info. Thanks. All right, y'all. We are back with Glenn Papelli. Papel. 
Popeil. Popeil, I I got it. I got it. First <laughs> time I made a mistake. I'm proud of myself. I'm patting myself on the back here. <laughs> I've heard it pronounced every way possible. <laughs> so in this segment, we're going to talk about his new book, the More Arduino for Ham Radio. And we're going to talk a lot more about some new projects that he has. Um, in this new book and some of the other stuff. And I've actually been looking at this on Amazon while while we've been talking in the break. And there's a lot of really neat little things in here. So I'm really interested in, in talking about this. Now, this book is a little bit more expensive than the original one. This one is thirty four seventy uh, through Amazon. And unfortunately, it's out of stock until the 13th. But you can buy it directly from, from ARRL. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so so if if you don't want to go on Amazon, I will have a link directly to the ARRL's site as well. But uh, Glenn, why don't you tell us a little bit about your new book? Okay, well, one of the reasons for the higher price is it's actually almost fifty percent larger than the first book. Wow. Uh, yeah, it didn't start out that way. It just ended up that way, um, and it was one of, we actually planned for twenty projects, and we started getting into it, and I'm like. Guys, this is this is going to be way too long, and so we actually cut it at fifteen projects, and we're thankful we did. And this was one of those books that just seemed to go on forever and ever, and I didn't really pay much attention to it until I did get at the end, and it's like, oh my gosh, no wonder I'm tired. This thing is, you know, one and a half times the size of the first one. <laughs> and and part of the reasoning for that is like the first book, we included the foundation material. There was some repetition, and there was some discussion on how to handle that. And the ending discussion was, yes, there's some repetition, but it's important. You know, we'll burn the pages, you know, we, you know, but it's important to have it. And we don't want to make people buy the first book just to get that material. So, mm -hmm. you know, we did a little bit of duplication. We tried to keep it to a minimum, but we also updated everything, you know, all the new boards, all the new modules, uh, some of the newer techniques and technologies that had come out since I wrote the first book uh, three years ago or four years ago. So it's, you know, but it's got that same foundation material. But then the next phase of it was uh, realizing that this more than likely, and I'm not going to say absolutely because who knows what happens in my mind over the next two or three years. Um, I may get one of these crazy ideas. But at this time, it was like I'm out of Arduino ideas. This is the last of them. Uh, the rest are more theory and can I really make these work level that would take a long time to work out and uh, these are the 15 that I did but part of the reason for it being this long is I challenged myself on this book I came up with the, the old favorite wouldn't it be cool if and added on is this even possible and so I challenged myself to come up with I don't want again it's not more complex in terms of building but they're more functional, more creative, uh, more practical, and a little further out there. You know, just about as wild and crazy as you can get and still have a practical ham radio project. And so that, you know, we went a little long because we, we as you see, we cover a lot of ground. I mean, mm -hmm. we go to, to wireless remote stuff and Ethernet and uh, transceivers and SWR analyzers. I mean, we just kind of cover the whole spectrum with this monster, and we do it large scale. Hmm. Uh, you know, we we're talking about you know uh, one of the projects in there is a, a a station power monitor. Well, with the design, and I actually produced two different designs, so it's actually a two project in one chapter. Uh, you can actually measure current up to 250 amps safely. Wow. And, you know, that's, it's not difficult to do. We're, we're talking a change out of a $2 component. <laughs> we'll let you read 5 amps, 20 amps, or 250, or anything in between. Wow. So, you know, it's, so that's why the book is that much bigger, is we just go into more depth and more fun projects, really. I, I'm really, pleased with the way everything turned out. I was surprised by the fact that I got some of them to work. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was also surprised at the lack of smoke that was created. Uh, you know, very, very, very little death in my components on this one. I think I fried one transistor on one of the transceiver boards, and that was pretty much it. Not, 
not very hard to build, you know. A lot of fun. I actually had fun doing this book. It was a lot of fun. So you, so you in, in the realizing that I said it wrong earlier, you didn't open your mouth and insert your foot. You you actually had fun on this one, huh? Yeah, I, on, the, on the third one, you know, once you've done the first two books, you get a a feel for your style, what works, what the readers want, what they're expecting. Uh, one thing, you know, anytime I get feedback or an email from somebody, whether it's positive or negative, I take it as constructive criticism. And I try to do better based on that. And, you know... Uh, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm just like everybody else. I build stuff. Yes, I violate Ohm's law sometimes. You know, <laughs> hey, it works. Uh, you know, forgive me. And uh, but uh, no, I I try to learn from my mistakes or things that I felt I could do better. And with this book, it was I've had two books ahead of it. I've got the outline process, and I actually changed up the process for this one. Uh, the first book. I would actually build the project, document it, and write the chapter as I went. With this book, I actually built all of the chapters, took extreme amount of notes, just ungodly amount of notes. At the end of the day, my stack of note folders for the second book was almost 20 inches high. Wow. So, and when I was done, I had, you know, and but when I finished the project, I documented, did my notes, and set it aside and built the next one. And then when they were all built, then I went back and revisited each one and then wrote the chapter about it uh, after having time to forget about it and learn it all over again. And that, to me, really helped the writing process this time around. And it went very, very quickly. It really did. It was, it was, I started it in, I want to say, March of last year. And we finished it right in the middle of February this year. And, we made it out with two weeks to spare, and it was out just in time for Dayton. Well, that's not bad, 11 months for this big of a book. No, like I say, it, everything just kind of flowed together. And, you know, when it's something that's your passion and that you feel comfortable working with, and I don't want to say good at because there are people lots better than me at this, but when, when you feel that you're, you're confident and good at what you're doing, it's much easier for the writing to happen. Mm-hmm. So it's... It, my advice to anybody that wants to write is sit down and try it and keep trying and keep trying, and you'll see the changes in each draft. You get better and better. And uh, that's kind of the way it was with me. And I'm sure my next book, in my opinion, will be better because I'll have learned from the mistakes from this one. Mm-hmm. But uh, it, you know, it, this one was really fun to build. The projects, when I select a project, I don't say, you know, here's a project for ham radio. I say, where in my shack will this project go? Because I use this stuff. You know, I've got the rotator controllers. I've got the JT65 rig. You know, I've got all sorts of things that I built that are in the book that are actually operating in my shack at any given time. Hmm. You know, I built these for me as much as I do for everybody else. It's really almost a diary of my DIY experiences as it is a, a book on for others to build stuff with the Arduino. Wow. That's, that, that's a good way to approach it, though. I mean, if, if you were going to use it yourself, then, you know, chances are somebody else is going to use it as well. So, right. Uh, good, good approach. It, it works, and, and I enjoy it. Like I say, that's why I got into the Arduino, was to build stuff for me. And if others can use it, that's cool. You know, it, it's a wonderful thing. So let's go ahead and talk about some of the things you got. You, you I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna not add, ask the question. I was just thinking about. Why don't you give me some of the, the um, easier or uh, maybe more useful uh, everyday person type projects that are in this book? Okay. Well, actually, in both both of my Arduino books, I start out. They were organized with the projects are in order of what I feel are. The easier builds and less complex graduating to the more complex. So it's kind of a progressive, get your, get your feet wet, get your hands on the ground, get used to this. And as you progress from chapter to chapter, you get more advanced and more advanced and learn more stuff. And uh, we start out with that auto on-off mobile power control. And this is a, uh Arduino interpretation of the... Uh, Oh gosh, what is that? The ISO Power and the Rocky Mountain Radio, the West Mountain Radio 
modules that will uh, turn your power on in your car when the motor is running, and then when you uh, turn the ignition off after a delay, it will shut the power down. Uh-huh. And this, it was actually targeted for the first book. Uh, we talked about it and said this would be cool, neat idea. And at that time, I'm like, but does it have a practical use? You know, I can't see this. I can't. I leave my radio on all the time in my car. Well, <laughs> I bought a new car or a newer car. And first thing I did, of course, is I put, you know, an 897 HF rig in it and 2 meter and 440. And I put the kitchen sink in there. I got APRS in it. <laughs> And I forgot to turn all that stuff off one day. Mm-hmm. And I came out about two days later, and I had dead battery. And I said, I get it now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so that's when I built this. And basically it's just uh, – it, it monitors your battery voltage. And when your motor's is running, uh, your battery voltage is around 13 volts and above as it charges the battery. And when you turn the engine off, the battery voltage drops below – uh, 13 volts to end up being about 12.4, 12.8 thereabouts. And so we just read the voltage on the Arduino's analog pin and power a relay, and then it's got a delay, so you can delay the startup and you can delay the shutdown, uh, just change the code in the program. And uh, you can also, it has a bypass switch. If you want to be in the car and you're shutting the motor off, but you don't want it to shut off, you can flip the bypass switch and it'll stay on and drain your battery when you forget to turn it off. Hmm. So you can have that same experience as before. Okay, so how much does this thing cost? Oh, gosh, just not much at all. I mean, you're talking an Arduino, uh, a relay, you know, just not a whole lot of parts at all. I'll look at the schematic here real quick, but it's not very expensive. I would say probably 10 bucks, if that. So you built you a thing for about 10 bucks or so that does the same, that actually kills the power to your radio when it goes dead. And I went out and bought me a fifty dollar jump pack to stick, keep in my car to to keep to jump myself off if I run out of power. <laughs> right. I mean, you're talking about a little Arduino Nano, which is three bucks. You know, a voltage regulator, an LED, and four transistors, a relay, a diode, and a couple caps and resistors. Hmm. So you're you're literally talking ten bucks or less. Yeah. So, and that that was my goal is I want practical, simple, inexpensive things to build, you know, because not everybody can afford the top end stuff. Mm -hmm. And particularly if you're raising a family, the other side of this is I'm seeing a lot of older hams getting involved with the Arduino so that they can get involved with their son or their grandson or their daughter or or granddaughter because the girls like playing with this Arduino too. And uh, there's a thing called wearable electronics and you can actually have conductive thread and sew LEDs and stuff into clothing. And that was actually the project that my friend built. She built a RF uh, signal strength monitor into a backpack. And it was a, 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 a row of LEDs that as the signal strength increased, the number of LEDs that were on increased. And she sewed that into the back of a backpack and had it walking around her at Dayton. <laughs> you know, so you, you know, this, like, but the, the the kids of all ages and sexes enjoy doing Arduino because you can do so much with it, not just ham radio. But anyway, my goal was to keep it simple because knowing a lot of people are new to the Arduino, new to soldering, um, this was something I never fully understood or or knew. I don't want to say understood, but knew was that not very many hams today can read a schematic. And so this is a great way to learn how to read a schematic and start simple and, and build forward. So you, you, you get a lesson in how to, how to build at the same time you're having fun. And so that's what it's all about. That's what I try to do. Um, moving on to an, – go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, moving on to another project, uh, I have a station power monitor. And this is actually kind of modeled after the old heat kit station monitors. Uh, you know, you had the time and the temperature and, uh, you know, all that cool stuff. And what I did is you monitor, you have the ability to monitor the DC current being used in your station plus temperature plus time. So you've got a little clock, a little cube clock radio and, you know, and you can monitor up to 250 amps with that thing. 
and it's not going to cost you again not much more than ten or twenty dollars to build hmm. and it uses a little color LCD display so you've got you know the full color graphics capability with it and uh, the next thing in it is uh, an AC current monitor uh, I don't know if you've seen them but there's this thing called a kilowatt EZ that is a uh, it you, you plug it into the wall and then you plug your device into it and it will tell you the voltage, the current it's drawing, and the kilowatt hours that it's using, and it will calculate the cost of this. And I said, I'd like to do this, but I'd like to do it non-intrusively. So I use one of those little clamp-on amp probes and measure the current on one leg of the AC and do the same thing. It tells you the AC current, uh, the kilowatt hours, and calculates the cost to run that particular device. Hmm. And again, that's a ten dollar item. I, I might be a little afraid to to do something like that. Nah. You, you I mean, afraid I, I mean, afraid of knowing how much power I use. Yeah, I was just going to say, afraid of knowing how much it costs. Yes. <laughs> uh, and then I've got a load tester. Uh, you know, how many times have you gone to a ham fest and seen a power supply and say, "Why is it so cheap? Is it working?" Or you get a battery, and it's like, does this battery really work, or is it at the end of its life? And uh, so what I did is I built a load tester that will let you use the Arduino to switch in uh, up to eight levels of resistance. And it will generate at 12 volts, it will create a load of 1.5 amps all the way up to 20 amps. And then it monitors the voltage and current. So you can actually see the discharge cycle of a battery. See if that power supply really is rated at 20 amps. And uh, interestingly enough, I have a brand new 25 amp power supply that I use as my test. And I rapidly discovered that even though it says it's 25 amps and it will run 23 amps continuous, um, after 20 minutes at 20 amps, it said, I'm thermally shutting down. So Nice. But, you know, that, that's a quick little fun project. Uh, I mean, how many times have you bought a battery and wondered, is it any good? Mm-hmm. You've got no way to test it, so that's what we did that. And then we've got the voice memory keyer. Um, I've got a, for my Go box, I've got a Yaesu 450, and it's got two voice memories. And if you're contesting, voice memories are the way to go. Um, and uh, I have actually, I, mean, I need to write this up for QST. Um when I'm working things like field day, uh, I do all of my keying with my with foot switches, except I have a assembly that has three foot switches on it. it. On the right, it will send what I call the short message, and that's a fast, you know, CQ contest, you know, just quickie go. And then I've got a longer one for when the band's a little quiet, you know, I'm just trying to get people's attention. And that's on the left pedal, and then the center pedal actually keys the push to talk on the mic. <laughs> so it's literally left foot, right foot, you know. And, and it, what it does is it plays recordings from the voice memory on the uh, the Yesu. Well, I said, this would be cool if I could build one that would work with any radio. Mm-hmm. And I came across a $5 voice module, and that thing has 200 and something memories. And it actually plays wave files that you create. And you can combine them all into phrases, and it comes with its own software to allow you to do the phrase creation and upload the WAV files to it. And once you upload it, it's standalone. So for five dollars, you've got a, you know, a two hundred and something voice memory box that will speak anything. That's an awful lot of foot switches. Yeah. <laughs> Think about it. Field day. How many different operators do you have? What if each operator recorded their own messages? Mm-hmm. So that when you changed operators, all they had to do was change position on the memory, and it's using their voice. So you know, you don't get confused when a male sends the C or a female sends the CQ, and a male comes back to you. You're like, what? <laughs> but this way, you can actually use their voices, so you've got the continuity involved. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, yes, I use a voice keyer, but I still like to play as fair as I can. Right. Uh, but anyway, uh, then moving on. Uh, I've got the wireless remote coax switch, and here's where we have a lot of fun. Um, we go into talking about the remote wireless remote coax switch. Uh, it, we use the Adafruit feather boards, 
and they have a variant on this that is a 900 megahertz industrial scientific and medical band transceiver that's 100 milliwatts. And so you've got a license-free transmitter at 100 milliwatts at 900 megahertz. Uh, it's, it's got a theoretical range of 20 kilometers line of sight. So 13 miles line of sight. No, I'm not going to run coax 13 miles. But the idea here is I don't want to run a coax switch cable out to my tower. I'd rather have the switch box out there and then the control box inside. Mm -hmm. And then it's just you know one run of coax back to the shack instead of the seven or eight that I've got now. And that was the concept. But then another variant came on that, which was, what about if you had a repeater site and you had a main antenna, but you just had a tornado come through or what we had come through here in Memphis just last week, you know, with 110-mile-an-hour straight-line winds? Mm -hmm. And what if it took the antenna off of your repeater site? But what if you had a little shorter, sturdier antenna that you could use your wireless telemetry to switch to and keep your repeater on the air even though your big antenna is laying on the ground. So think about the ability to remotely control an antenna at, you know, 13 miles. Uh, and then that led on to the wireless remote telemetry. And this is why I kind of cut you off on the weather station a little while back. We did another variant on that and just turned it around and now at the repeater site, for example, you have temperature, humidity, um, you can have barometric pressure, you can have intrusion detection alert that if somebody opens the cabinet, it will flag an alert. And it will report all of this back to the central unit sitting on your desk. Hmm. And, and so you can have this, you know, you know, 13 so miles away or, you know, down the street or if you wanted to build a wireless weather station for your house – have the sensor box outside and your main display box inside so you can have it totally wireless so what uh, what uh, what radio thing would that use though it uses it's called the Adafruit Feather LoRa L O R A and that stands for long range the radio is actually built onto the Arduino board hmm. it's a board that is about the size of two postage stamps stuck end to end and it's uh, it uses actually uses an ARM Cortex processor instead of the the standard Arduino uh, processor, and it uh, it gives you a lot more memory, a little more I/O, and of course you've got the 900 megahertz transceiver that you can play with. Hmm. So, uh, and it's all built on the one board, so very easy to use. And it's even got a little, uh, it's got a little pad on it, so you can solder on an external uh, antenna jack, uh, and you can screw on any antenna that'll work with SMA. Hmm. So you know, you you can slap on your own antenna. So that's that's why I kind of cut you off on the weather station before, because this is actually a an even cooler version of the weather station from the first book. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, the next thing, again, back in the contest spirit. Uh, how many times have you been at a contest or like uh, the National Parks on the Air or in the middle of nowhere where you don't have cell phone, you don't have a WWV, you've got no way to get the current time, and you want to work JT65, which is time sensitive. Uh, I built a GPS-based uh, Ethernet network time protocol that will pull the time off of GPS and then make it accessible over the Ethernet. And if your club is like ours doing contests, we run a little wireless network. So you could just plug this into the wireless network and bang, everybody gets the exact synchronized network time. And it's a stratum one clock. It's, uh, the Ethernet makes it a stratum two clock. So you've got about the most accurate time you could possibly have on your portable operation. And wow. that uses a $5 Ethernet board. Hmm. And... Uh, then this is this is one of those. Uh, I got a rig. It's got a function. I can't use that function. I can't allow this. Uh, ideas. I've got a 950 as the main. A Yesu 950 is my main rig in the shack. And the 950 has the ability to control an antenna rotor directly from the front panel buttons. 
if it was the Yaesu DX8 series rotor. Well, I don't have a Yaesu DX8 series rotor. I've got the Yaesu G800 rotor, and I've got a 450, and I've got a couple CDEs laying around, but I don't have that one. So what I did is I actually took a variation of the CDE project in the first book, the high gate, the Ham M project in the first book, and adapted it so that I could use it to be controlled by my uh, front panel of the ASU 950. So if you've got a, a ASU 950, a 1200, 3000, uh, those all have that same interface built right in. So it's kind of neat to be able to not have to reach up and hit your rotor buttons or find your computer control program, just to touch the front panel buttons on the rig. Nice. Um, and then the next, uh, those of us that have had the Yaesu 450 and 800 uh, older rotors, uh, the main control board tends to die with old age, and you can't calibrate them and you can't get a replacement board, so you're pretty much out of luck. And I designed an Arduino board that completely replaces that uh, Yesu board that's inside the box, and it's actually plug compatible. It uses the existing connectors for the original board, plug it in, and it duplicates the functions of that board, and it also gives you remote control capability. And then we ver- did a variation on that uh, for those lucky enough to have a working one. Uh, there's a, a project that actually modifies the working one to give you the computer control on it. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately, my whole shack's 99% Yesu. I'm sorry about that. But, <laughs> you know, your challenge, you got a Kenwood or want to do something like that with a Kenwood, here's the guts. You can figure it out and make it work with yours. Mm-hmm. But, I, I um, won't hold that against you. No, it's it just, you know, again, practical. What do I want to use in my shack? And unfortunately, I don't have access to a Kenwood 570 or anything like that laying around, or I would have done done some for that somebody wants to donate one to me i'll be glad to work on it uh, <laughs> but uh the, that's one of the other projects and this is more of a generic project is a 1 to 30 megahertz uh vfo that's accurate to like 0.01 hertz um, it's a digitally controlled synthesizer and the module is like ten dollars and it's highly precise and uh so I built the, the v, uh, it's called a direct digital synthesis uh, module, it's DDS, and I built a 1 to 30 megahertz VFO, and it also has the ability to drive an older tube rig. It's got a little higher power on the output section you can use, and uh, my, my thinking was, you know, if you, if you want to play with the older tube rigs but modernize them, you could actually put an Arduino in one, and actually one of my next projects happen to be something I've been talking about for years, is my first rig was a Heathkit HW16, and I love that radio. It was CW only, and I just love that radio. And I promised myself that I was going to get another one, and then I was going to put an Arduino in it and really take it to the 21st century. And at the Memphis Free Fest a few months ago, I got my HW16. <laughs> so there you go. I've got the VFO for it already in the book. Uh, and then the other thing, uh, again, uh, practical projects. I've got the MFJ antenna analyzer. I love them. Uh, I think everybody should have some form of antenna analyzer, be it the Comet or the MFJ or any of the others out there. They are just, you know, for us that were old school and we had to cut our dipole, run inside, check the SWR, run outside, cut it, run inside, scream and moan because we'd cut it too short, go out and add wire. <laughs> Uh, really, you know, don't know what they've got when they've got one of these analyzers. But again, I said, I would like an analyzer. And a friend of mine has uh, the VNA analyzer that will sweep the band and give you a graph and everything. I said, I want that. So I actually uh, used a DDS module and the SWR uh, meter design. And I actually scan an entire band, like six, uh, 40 meters or 20 meters or 160, it will scan the entire band measuring about 100 set points. And you can change that, of course, but you could scan 100 points across the band. It will calculate the SWR at each point. And when it's done, it actually graphs the SWR curve for the antenna on that band. Now, is that just so, for HF bands or does that cover VHF, UHF also? 
No, strictly HF. The uh, the DDS module will only go up to uh, 62 and a half meg. It's 125 meg, but uh, you, cut, you have to cut it in half for it to be reliable and functional. You know, provide you a functional uh, sine wave. But uh, so it's, it goes up to 62 meg. Uh, so it covers six. Now there's another chip out there, the SI5351, and I believe it goes up to 160 meg, and you could easily adapt it to this design and do the same thing. So you could build your own to bring you up to two meters. Cool. And then we come into my favorites. <laughs> um, uh, we've got the 40 meter QRP transceiver, and uh, you saw a few months ago in QS that there is a lot of discussion. I also believe in last month's CQ about using these $11 Chinese CW transceiver boards and building your own little QRP transceiver. And what I did, uh, Tom Medlin was the one who actually introduced me to these. Um, I got it. First thing I did was hook a, a DDS to it. So now I've got, you know, wider frequency. And then I opened up the receive filter because it's a crystal receive filter. So I changed that. To a, an LC circuit to widen the uh, the bandwidth. So now these rigs will tune the entire 40 meter band, and so now you've got a 40 meter band QRP transceiver um, that's digitally controlled, um, gives you about you know a watt out, and also it's got a built in electronic keyer, uh, receive incremental tuning, and you can control the tuning speed. You can have it tune in multiple tuning rates. So you don't have to tune it just 1 hertz or 100 hertz. You can zap around the band. And this whole thing costs about $40 to build. And it fits inside a 3 by 3 inch baseball display cube I got from Hobby Lobby. Hmm. And, wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, actually, uh, there's a video on Facebook about me. Uh, Sean Kutzko interviewed me at Dayton, and I had that. So there's a video of that. Uh, I deliberately didn't show anybody that. The one in the book uses a softball cube, so it's a little bit bigger, and it uses the older Nokia black and white display. The one I built for Dayton, uh, as I said before, I never really finished out a project uh, wanting to challenge you, the reader, to, to move forward. This one I said, this is going to be my homebrew contest entry this year. It's getting the kitchen sink. So I finished that one out with the kitchen sink. So it's got the color display and every bell and whistle I could possibly put in it. And it still didn't cost me over 40 bucks. Hmm. And so you got yourself a little QRP transceiver that's, you know, a little cube that you can throw in a backpack or anywhere. And it runs off a 9-volt battery so, or a 12-volt battery. You know, I, I've got a little 12-volt battery pack on AA batteries. So there you go. And how long, how long does that battery pack last then when you're working? Uh, about a day. Really? It, it last, I had it powered up at uh, Dayton for two days. Now, we didn't do a whole lot of transmitting, but we did a little bit. I had it powered up for two whole days. The batteries were still there, just barely. Hmm. So, you know, not a lot of power is pulled by this stuff. Very low power. And then the last project in the book, and we were talking about, you know, forums and ham fests and things like this. This came as a result, and this was one of the things that probably led into me doing the first book. Uh, I had done my first Arduino forum to a packed house. It was wonderful, and I actually felt like I knew what I was doing, and we had fun. And one of the uh, gentlemen in the forum asked a question of, will it do JT65? And what he was talking about is we had just introduced the Tentec Rebel, which was their open source transceiver, and you had the code and everything. And... We kind of looked at each other, and I, I got this really confused look on my face of, first of all, what's JT65? I don't have a clue. <laughs> all right, so I got the brief fill on on that because I knew about PSK. I'm like, oh, okay. And then it was, but this is a CW-only rig. Wait a minute. And then the old school, and this is where, you know, being a ham from the old days actually pays off. Um uh, Back in the old days for radio teletype, we used to use frequency shift keying uh, to generate it rather than send audio on HF. <clears throat> so I was like, well, you know, if you could use a DDS and shift the frequency fast enough and do this, 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 and this, I think it'll work. Well, one of the guys in the gang knew Joe Large, who wrote JT65HF, got him involved, and he was all over it. And in just a matter of weeks, we, we had turned a CW transceiver into a JT65 transceiver. 
And what we do is you use the PC. It sends control codes to the Arduino, and the Arduino then tells the DDS what frequency the tone needs to be, and then it does the frequency shift. Hmm. So it's still a CW rig, but it's shifting frequency, and on the receiving side, you hear a tone. So you and I, so it'll send. Basically, we're digitally sending JT65, and then on the decode side, we're still using the audio decoder in your PC to to get the receive. And that one cost about sixty five bucks. And we did that on the Ten Tech Rebel. And then when we finished up on the Rebel project, and I started on this book, I'm like, can I do it with one of these little Chinese radios? And so that was again one of those. Wouldn't it be cool if things? And is this really possible? And I took the code that we'd written for the Rebel and adapted it because uh, it was basically the same code. Adapted it into the DDS module I was using and the JT65 uh, Chinese transceiver board that I, or the CW transceiver board I was using. Turned the power down so I didn't fry a transistor more than the one or two I already had. And lo and behold. I had a JT65 transceiver that fit in a little 4x4 cube, and uh, I entered that in the homebrew contest three years ago, and it took best in show. And so that's how I ended up with that little boy. So. You know, the the longer we talked about this thing, <laughs> about this book, and the more projects you told us about, the more and more that I'm, I just don't like you, man. <laughs> I'm 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 sitting here actually on the the AWR website. I have it in my cart. I'm fixing to buy this thing. <laughs> this this not right. <laughs> I have my disclaimer. I did not make you do this. Uh-huh. But but what you're dealing with is you're dealing with a ham who's been doing this all these years. Has been through the old days with the older hard way. Found the new stuff. Found that it's fun. It's easy. And even this old brain can be taught it. It's fun. But at the same time, I'm wild and crazy. I don't do normal. I like to do different. I like to do things that – I don't want to say things that nobody else has done, although the biggest challenge you could give me is to tell me it can't be done. I will spend the next six months trying to figure out a way and then bang my head against the wall and say, okay, you're right. But to me, that's the challenge is I don't take it can't be done or it's never been done as uh, the end of it. I'm, I'm like, well – have you looked at it from a different way? Let's jump outside the box. As a matter of fact, throw the box away. Let's run down the street, and then let's look and see what we can do with this. And like I say, a JT65 rig came from a simple forum question. That's just, you know, one, you know where, where do you get these ideas? It's, you know, look around you, ask your friends, what do you need, you know, out of your ham shack? What appliance? What accessory? What would you think would be cool? You know, and that's where I start, and then I get it with my friends who have similar ideas, and then of course a lot of them are new to ham radio. They've they've never built anything, and so I'm like, you're new to this. What would you want to do if you were a builder? And so I take a lot of those ideas, and that's what rattles around for a while. And books like this is what falls out. Hmm. And uh, you know, like I said, now you can see why I had so much fun writing about them. I have so much fun talking about them. Yeah. Just because of the process that went into creating some of these is just, you know, a simple word or, a, you know, something said over coffee or at a meeting or whatever, or something that went on at HamFest. Uh, I got an email from a gentleman who actually built the fan speed controller from my first radio or from my first book because he had his Elecraft and had just gotten an amplifier for it and was running it on a D-Expedition and it ran hot. And it did a thermal shutdown. And so he got home, and the first thing he did was grab my book and build the thermal, uh, the fan speed controller. And now he's got the fan speed controller on his Elecraft amplifier, and now he can play as long as he wants. So that tells me these projects do have a practical use. I must be hitting the right target. And like I say, I have fun doing this. This is when I sit down at my bench, it's like, what wild and crazy and insane thing can I do today? <laughs> and yet at the end, it still has the same constraints as somebody else has to be able to build this. It has to be easy. It has to be understandable. And it has to be cheap. And, 
you know, I try to keep all the projects as cheap as I, like I say. If you can build a a transceiver like the CW one I'm talking about for forty bucks, I mean that's about as cheap as you can build a radio. Yeah. You know, and some of the other projects, the remote telemetry. I look at that, and it's like I've got a nine hundred megahertz, you know, hundred milliwatt transceiver. That as long as I follow the rules of the ISM, the Industrial Scientific Medical Band, I can do anything with it. And you know, then you're you're looking at what can you know, what can you do with that kind of a transceiver and Arduino and control and remote capabilities and things of that nature. Uh, one gentleman had actually Arduinoized his whole Christmas display and had thousands of lights and synchronized music and it was all powered by Arduinos. So that's that's where I get my wild and crazy ideas. And, and that's that's where I get people like you to buy my books. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. Well we will have links to uh, each of his books, uh, both on Amazon through my affiliate links and on uh, the ARRL if they are not on there. So I will have links on those. I'm going to see if I can find the interview that that, uh, that you were talking about a little earlier and put that in the show notes as well. Um, so, Glenn, thank you very much for coming on. This has been a very, very enlightening and unfortunately probably money-hungry episode <laughs> I did. from the sounds of it <laughs> it was never my intent um it's just that's what that's what draws the arduino people into the arduino is they're in familiar with it and then once they become familiar with it then they hear about the crazy stuff i've done they're like well oh, i can do this mm-hmm. so but now here here's the bad news you're gonna have to interview me again at some point because we didn't even get into the microwave networking book you're right <laughs> You're, you're absolutely right. You will have to come. You will have to come back on. So definitely. <laughs> see, see. So now I got you to buy my book, and I got you to get me to come back on. There you know, you. Do you see the strings controlling your arms and stuff at this? <laughs> oh but, well. Now I just have so much fun with this, and I've enjoyed this. Thank you so much. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much for coming on, and and uh, um, is there get uh. Can you do you mind giving us giving my listeners your email address in case they have any questions about uh, any Arduino questions? Would you answer those for them? Oh, absolutely! I I respond to any and all email, um, even if you yell at me, I still respond. Um, <laughs> it's uh, kw five gp kilo whiskey five golf papa at arrl dot net. Nice, simple, and easy. Thank and you. of course, that's in all the books as well. All right. So, if you have any Arduino questions, I'm sure you, I'm sure Glenn will be happy to answer them. I'm sure he probably gets a lot of them. So, give him some time. But uh, um, I'm sure you will be receiving a couple from me once I get your book and the Arduino and stuff. So, be on the lookout. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna. I don't know, maybe put like a fancy subject line or something like that, so you can see that it's me, so you can answer it. Well, right believe away, it or okay? not, I really don't get tons of email. I get, I don't want to say lots. I get email on a regular basis and so no it's relatively easy for me to see it i generally respond if i'm sitting in front of the computer i'll respond right back um since i don't have a book in progress at the moment i keep saying that at the moment that's gonna change um i've got uh, yeah no no it's not a matter of knock on wood it's a matter of when i capitulate and start writing i've already been told um you know they want another book so uh it's just a matter of Resting myself from this one, but no, I, I will answer any and all email. And you know, I love you know, if you have an idea you want to collaborate on, I will be glad to help you as much as I can. Uh, you know, but uh, you know, I'll be glad to help as much as I can because this is my way of elmering and helping others. So anything I can do, I enjoy. Great. Well, thank you, Glenn, Glenn, for coming on. I greatly appreciate it, and I hope that each of y'all have enjoyed this as much as I have. So, uh, Glenn, seventy three to you, and. Uh, I, we will have you back for, <laughs> to talk about your other book and, I guess, maybe mesh networking in general as well. So, Yeah, I'll have some more secrets out by then anyway, so that would be a good time. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Glenn. Thank you for coming on, and have a great evening. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Bye. All right, y'all, so there it is. There was the interview with Glenn, and I hope that y'all enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed doing it. Uh, there is a lot of information about Arduino and a lot of stuff that I had no idea about. 
um, and making all these projects for such a small dollar amount. I mean, anything from you know a five dollar thing up to a forty dollar or forty meter uh, QRP rig. So uh, again, thank you for coming, uh, Glenn, for coming on to the show today. And uh, you can find all of his books. Um, I have links on Amazon uh, through my affiliate link as well as uh, directly to the ARRL where you can buy his books. And I do have the, uh, the video that he was talking about uh, where it shows uh, the, Q- the uh, 40 meter QRP rig um, in the show notes. So definitely go over and check those out. Uh, again, you can find those at everythinghamradio.com forward slash podcast forward slash 72. Uh, again, please follow me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash everything ham radio, or you can go to the actual page um, at uh, facebook.com forward slash everything ham radio. I am on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash everything ham radio. Last episode, I did a little bit more than what I normally do for a YouTube video, and I'm going to try and at least do that from now on. Uh, I am going to try and do a couple other little uh, things on the videos. Uh, as I work my way up to actually having maybe a live picture of me talking or or something. <laughs> I doubt that I'll ever actually do a video interview because the bandwidth that it takes and, and you know, I'm sitting here on a, on a cell phone uh, Wi-Fi uh, hotspot. So I doubt that will ever happen, uh, at least for the foreseeable future. But I am going to have you know, maybe some slides up or something like that, something more that you can look at other than just the logo uh, on the videos on YouTube, so uh, subscribe to that channel. In, in, anyways, um, yeah, so please do that. Um, and last but not least, you can find me on Twitter at K5CLM, where I'm probably the most uh, active on. Um, if you haven't subscribed to my email list, please do so. You can go to the show notes, and there's a link at the bottom where you can uh, subscribe. Uh, or you can go to everythinghamradio.com forward slash subscribe and do it that way. Uh, simply fill out the form, click the sign me up button. You'll get an email from me with a link that you'll need to click on in order to start receiving email from me. Um, and last but not least, uh, if you like what you've heard here and would like to help support this podcast financially, there are several ways you can do it. Uh, you can make a one-time donation through PayPal. Uh, you can become a per-episode contributor through Patreon. Uh, or you can simply shop on Amazon uh, through my affiliate links. Uh, there is an affiliate link button on the uh, sidebar on the main page, um, and there is a donate button at the bottom of the show notes. Uh, but you can also go to uh, everythinghamradio.com forward slash support and find out more about each one of those things. Uh, last but not least, I do have a swag store with a few items in there. I have a coffee cup, uh, coasters, um, I have a mouse pad, um, and a couple other little things. I'm continually trying to get some more stuff on there. I'm currently working on trying to get some t-shirts and some hats made. Um, I got a couple other ideas as well. Um, and I am working right now, probably tomorrow, I hope to finish it up on uh, a um, desktop call sign plate that I'm going to be selling. That is for sale up on the, on the swag store right now, but did, definitely check that out. And you can find that at everythinghamradio.com forward slash store. So uh, I guess that's pretty much it. Uh, I really had a great uh, talk with Glenn, and we will have him back on again probably around uh, mid-August or so, uh, where we're going to talk about his other book, The High Speed Multimedia, um, and basically him, uh, our mesh net in general. So look forward to that, and uh, I guess until next time, this is K5CLM signing off. 73, y'all.